Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Hello, my name is Mark. I'm an alcoholic. Hi, Mark. Um, I, uh, I'm going to try to condense this in 10 minutes. Um, when I was growing up, um, both my parents were alcoholic. Uh, they uh, they used to manage and, and co-own a, a tavern in a town that uh, I was raised in, in Los Angeles. And, uh, you know, until I was about eight, I grew up in that bar. And alcohol was part of my life, basically. Um, and, uh, you know, I mean, it was just normal for me to have alcohol around. And uh, I think I was about oh, 12 years old when I first started to drink. And um, I started getting in trouble with the law and just doing stupid shit when I was younger. Um, my mother uh, and father split up, and with the trouble I was getting into, she sent me to Arizona uh, to be with my uncle, which, uh, you know, he was kind of st- straightforward, and, but he was an alcoholic. Um, and I, I started school there, and uh, he busted us one time. At that time, alcohol was, you only had to be about 18 years old to buy alcohol at that time in Arizona. And so alcohol was pretty easy for us to, to get, get a hold of. Um, and he busted us uh, drinking and playing hacky sack in a park one time. And we, we, got, uh, we got read the riot act. But he also said that if you wanted to drink, uh, you could drink at home rather than be on the street and get in trouble. So that's what we did, you know. Whenever we wanted alcohol, we just asked him, and he'd bring whatever we, whatever we asked for. And, uh, you know, um, ultimately, just about two years ago, he died of uh, cirrhosis of the liver. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, the trouble I was getting into was due because of the alcoholism, and uh, as well as I messed around with drugs for a while, too. Um, I moved back to uh, California and moved back to the same neighborhood I was in and continued to hang around the people that, you know, weren't, you know, weren't doing me any good, but it was my choice. Uh, I, uh, I was in and out of prison for a while. Um, and it wasn't until, uh, uh, I sir, I got sentenced to six years, ended up doing eight and I tried to, uh, vow that, you know, especially losing my mother while I was in there. But um, in 2003, uh, they diagnosed me with uh, hepatitis C and cirrhosis of the liver. And, you know, I was thinking to myself, oh, these are just, you know, doctors. They don't know what the hell they're talking about. You know what I mean? (laughs) Prison doctors, you know. Uh, But uh, so, you know, I kind of ignored it. And when I got out, at that time, I I tried to straighten out and did the right thing for a while. Uh, I had been married twice before that and divorced, and uh, and because of alcohol, um, you know, it was pretty pretty obvious. But I was in denial. I blamed. I just wanted to party, basically. And uh, um, let me see. It was about oh, it was about. I, I had my first daughter, and, you know, uh, I ended up in prison. Didn't see much, much of her life. But, um, uh, sorry, I'm a little nervous. Uh, You're doing great. But uh, I, when I did get out, I, like I said, I, I became a little successful. I uh, had a little business going, and uh, then self-sabotage came in. And uh, I started drinking pretty heavy and messing around with meth. And, uh, you know, I ultimately lost everything. I said, I'd be, you know, I wasn't going back to prison. And I got busted on a beef, and uh, they tried to give me 15. And uh, 
I kind of, you know, I spent everything I had to stay out, but I still got three years. So I did that time, and all that time I was still getting sick. You know, I got out. I was clean for a while, and uh, I moved to Texas to be. I had grandchildren by that time, and uh, so I went out there, and that's when my my drinking kind of really got out totally out of control. I was drinking about a fifth and a half a day. Uh, couldn't couldn't function without a drink in the morning. I worked, did what you know what you know, what was asked of me at work, but, you know, I was drunk half the time, you know. Um, within a month, I ended up in the hospital about four times. Uh, I swelled up really bad. Um, I was jaundiced. They pumped, like, two gallons of fluid out of my stomach. Um, and uh, the last time I went to the doctor, he said that, uh, you know, that my liver was failing and that, if I didn't get help, I was going to die. So I uh, I called my mother or my sister out here. She lived in the Bay Area, and I asked her. I asked her for some help, and she uh, she found a program called New Bridge. There's a few here today that are here supporting me, a few of my family members. Um, and uh, I still I got here, and I still was drinking I, for about a month. I ended up in the hospital here. And they told me that uh, ultimately I would need a, a liver transplant. And uh, so I, I, went, I got clean. My sister took a week off because I didn't want to do the Cherry Hill. So I got clean at her house, went into the program, and, um, you know, I, I started doing the right thing. Um, I, got on a, I got on a program to where I would be able to, you know, get on a list for, for, a, for a liver. And that just happened not too long, about six, seven months ago. Um, um, I'm living at one of the satellite houses now and working there uh, at the, uh, at Newbridge. Um, but past this past Thursday or yeah, Thursday, I had a, like a round table with some doctors that are going to be involved with my uh, transplant. And my liver shows is showing sign of regeneration, so um, the hepatitis is gone by itself. I didn't have to get treated for it, um, but by you know by doing the right thing, listening to my doctors, so they're going to monitor me for another year and not not worry about it. They're going to monitor me and see how my liver is in a in a year from now, and uh, you know it was uh, it was a blessing because my higher power. And the support that I have today uh, within these rooms and with the program I'm in um, has brought me this far because uh, I was pretty much I was pretty much through with life and I'm too young and I got grandchildren and I want to be around for them. You know, I wasn't around for my kids, so at least I can try to be around for them. Um, I'm going to cut it short and sweet. So thank you for listening. Thank you for the newcomers. Have this. I want it. I'm going to mic up. You can wear it. I'm going to be loud enough. All right. Yeah. All right. So, I'll just flash it whenever. Okay. <laughs> Hi, everybody. Hello. Hi. My name is Mary, too, and I'm an alcoholic. Hi, Mary. Hi, everybody. I share my last name with you because here in Alcoholics Anonymous, we have a really clear level at which we maintain our anonymity. That's at the level of press, radio, film, <coughs> television, and internet. So when you're fucking around on Facebook later on tonight, please don't share my last name, but feel free to do whatever you're going to do because I can't stop you anyway. The other reason that I share my last name with you is because I don't have anything to hide anymore. And if I fall down and I break my leg, I want you to be able to come visit my ass in the hospital. And it's real hard to be like, you know, Mary, she goes to my meeting. Can I see her in the hospital? You know, Mary. No. Come see me. Um... You know, and it was a big deal. It was a big deal for me in Alcoholics Anonymous when I became the, the male contact for our area in general service, right? Because when I got here, when I came into Alcoholics Anonymous, I was all about lies and deceit. 
right? Like my life was like lie upon lie upon lie. Like, like I had an alter ego for every group of people that I was with and I didn't know who the fuck I was and I didn't know, you know, like my lies were so incredible by the time I got here. I just didn't know anymore because that's all I knew. Uh, I'll get into that a little bit later. Uh, my sobriety date is November 3rd, 1992. I share that because where I got sober, they would talk about if you haven't had, your, if you don't know when your last drink was, maybe you haven't had it yet. <laughs> right? And that's like, they were salty, man. And they were like, they were like, there's also like this really crusty old timer guy who'd be like, oh, I spilled more, you know, alcohol, more beer than you ever drank. Right. My salty response to him was always like, well, if you hadn't spilled so goddamn much, maybe you would have gotten sober earlier. <laughs> um, because I was that kid. Right. I was 19 when I got here, you know, and, and being a teenage sober person, you get to hear a lot of things like, oh, isn't it great? And blah, blah, blah. And that shit sucks. It sucks being it sucks being a teenage alcoholic, first of all. Right. Because there's there's so little glamour in drinking in the woods, right? Like, that's not cool, you know? Drink it out behind your middle school. <laughs> it's not cool, right? Like, you know, like casing your friend's house to see who had the best liquor cabinets and keeping your eye on that shit, right? Because, like, you can't, like, like, I was, I'm, you know, would like to consider myself pretty smart. Like, and I figured out pretty early that if I was going to drink the way I needed to drink, at, you know, 11, 12, and 13, that I had to be at least a little savvy about that stuff because I didn't want to get caught because I fucking hated people. And confrontation is not a problem for me, right? So <laughs> if your mom or dad are going to confront me, it's going to go all the way and it's not going to be cool and I'm not going to have any more, you know, liquor from your liquor cabinet. So I had to case your shit, right? I had to see whose parents drank and whose parents didn't, right? Like who's like, who's got the different bottles in their in their things? Because I know, right? Like, I know you can't just add water to that shit. You know, like, you can't do that. You can't add water to the vodka that's in the freezer, right? That's not going to work because there's eventually going to be an ice cube in it. Maybe because I did that. <laughs> Maybe. Um, because alcohol was the solution for me, right? My, my alcoholism, right, makes me super sensitive. Right? Like, I am super sensitive to the world and its people. Right? Like, everything is about me and not in a good way, not in like a self centered, like, I'm a princess way. In like the everything you do fucking affects me and hurts me and makes me feel shit. And I can't handle it. Right? I can't handle it. So I need to be drunk. I need to have a buffer. I need to have something between you and me because it, oh. God. And it's been that way since I can remember. I come from, you know, a classic alcoholic family. Alcohol was my mom's solution, so alcohol became my solution, and that shit worked. When I was 11, and I couldn't read or write in school, and shit was bad, right? Shit was just bad. I found alcohol, and that shit worked, and it wasn't so bad. You know, and then I found alcohol in the morning, and that shit was not so bad, right? And then I found sneaking out at night and that shit was awesome so fun right like so fun to be a superhero and to you know be in these situations and not have it affect me right like i could i did some crazy shit right um by the time i was 13 i was carrying a gun right <laughs> which i should not be armed Right, just just so you know, like in any state, I should not be armed, and especially when I'm drunk, really, because I'm a mean drunk. I've always been a mean drunk. I'm kind of mean in my heart anyway. <laughs> so, like, I am not, I am not the jovial one, right? Um, you know, and and I look at back on my drinking career, and I look back on the things that I did, and I look at some like like 12, 13, and 14-year-old girls that I'll see around, and it just boggles my mind now because I've been sober for a while, right? Like, I've been sober for more than half my life, which still boggles my mind, right? Still, I'm just like, is that really true? Like, I sit down and do the math every year. I'm like, okay, I know I was sober in 92. That means that I have how many years now? Wow. Okay, that's happening. Um 
And I'm like, I'm a little lost. In my, I've had a lot of coffee. I quit <laughs> drinking coffee a little while ago. I've had two cups of coffee tonight, so I apologize. <laughs> Seemed like a good idea at the time. <laughs> Maybe wasn't so much. And some cookies. I don't really eat sugar, so I'm a little wired. <laughs> so please bear with me if this is not as, you know, straightforward as I would like it to be. Um, the good news is, is that I haven't rehearsed this three times, so you might actually get that really awesome pitch, right? Like the one that I usually do in the shower when I'm all like, okay, I'm going to go, and it's going to be awesome, and I'm going to, like bring the enlightenment of AA to everybody and we're all going to just walk out of here and feel great and I just rocks, right? Because that's what I do, right? Like I give my little, you know, pitch to a few times and I get here and I'm like, I don't know. I don't know anything about anything. <laughs> Fuck. Don't drink. Um, <laughs> try AA. Might work for you. Uh, so my sobriety date. Right, where I got sober in this small town in northeastern Pennsylvania, right? And they would say shit just like if you haven't had your last drink, maybe you don't know, you know, maybe you haven't had it yet, right? Because there were a lot of people who would come into AA and be like, well, I don't know. I don't know if I'm an alcoholic. And these people would see a lot of people retread in this little tiny town where your shit is on Front Street because it's like, I don't know, 20,000 people, small, small town, right? So you know when somebody relapses and you know how nasty it is, and you know that you're an alcoholic. Um, and so they were real serious about this stuff because they watched a lot of people die because it was a small town. Um, and in point of fact, the I think I was about a month sober, and this one woman, also Mary, was her name. She had been a pillar of AA. Like, she was, like, the half of, like, one of the AA, you know, couples that, like, met in AA. Like, they were... You know, Mr. and Mrs. AA, they were doing it all. It was all great, right? And, you know, they had a baby and all this stuff and yada, yada. And something happened. Like, he started to, he relapsed. And then she was still coming around and, you know, having a hard time and coming around and coming around. And then one morning, you know, somebody said, oh, Mary, you know, Mary died. And everyone was like, well, what happened? They're like, well, apparently she was drinking scope mouthwash. And she had drunk so much scope that she fell off the couch and hit her head and bled out because her, th her, her blood was so thin from the amount of scope she was drinking, right? And I was a month sober, and that shit was kind of like, whoa, right? Because Mary was like a pillar, right? Like, she was that <clears throat> person. She was, you know, had been at all the meetings that I had been to, and she was doing AA, and here the what she was dead from hitting her head on, on, on the coffee table. And that was my first AA death, right? And people said, you know, get get a dress, get a black dress, because you're going to go to a lot of funerals. And I was like 19. I'd, you know, been around some death, right, because I had hit up the streets a lot. So I'd seen a lot of death and, you know, fucked up shit. So I'm like, death doesn't scare me. That's cool. Like, whatever. Cool. Let's go. Um, but then when other people you know, started to die of alcoholism, it kind of set in, you know, that this shit is not a game, right? And when I was 19, you know, it kind of was, right? Because I was invincible, right? Like, that shit hadn't killed me. I had, I had some liver shit going on. That shit is for real. So I'm super glad to hear your story. Thank you, Mark, for sharing. I'm really glad you were here tonight because that shit's real, right? That's what we do. You know, for a long time when I, I came into AA, I was like, oh, I can't drink because I'm going to die right away, right? I was like, I'm going to drink, and I'm going to die. And oh my God, I've got to stay sober, right? And now, I'm not so sure, right? Like, I'm not so sure that that's how it would play out. Like, I can definitely see myself drinking, because I still have a relationship with AA, with alcohol, right? Like, me and Costco, right? Like, I go to Costco now, <laughs> which is also crazy to me, like a grown-up person. Like, walk in with my credit card to buy groceries for a week. <laughs> walking along Costco and I see all the stuff that I want and then I get to the alcohol right and I remember the first time like I think it was probably the first or second time that I'd actually ever been in a Costco and, and there was a, a pyramid of smear notes <laughs> right and I'm with a, a, a non-AA friend and we're like walking down and I'm all like hello <laughs> right and I am mesmerized by this shit like there is enough here there's like two pallets of alcohol <laughs> right 
right? I'm over 21. I have a credit card that could come home with me. And I am now having a relation, I'm having a conversation with this inanimate object. And I am years sober, probably like 10 years sober, because I was here in California. Like, like not, not, not a new, not, you know, like, there it is. Hello, alcohol. That's one of those things that reminds me that I'm an alcoholic. I have a different relationship with alcohol than normal people. My friend was like, what, what is going on? I'm like, I can't. Yeah. And she's like, yeah, we got to get a chicken. I'm like, there's alcohol. I have to have a little conversation with this shit. You know? And that's what reminds me. Because, again, like, I was 19, and I have now had that experience where most of the people that I got sober with, even most of the people that were here in AA, are no longer here. Right. Some of them, some of them have, in point of fact, died of alcoholism. And some of those fuckers are just not here. Right. And they're doing their lives. Right. And, and I am a judgmental, judgy McJudgerton at your service. <laughs> you need anybody to, to, you need a judgment. I got it for you. <laughs> Real good at it. You know, and, and, you know, I've gotten to see people come into AA and be very zealous and, and work the steps and have their lives change and stay sober for, for long periods of time and then decide that AA is not for them anymore. And that shit bakes my noodle every time, right? Because I come from the school of like, if I'm not in AA, I'm going to drink and die. And it's not going to be pretty. Like, I'm pretty sure that that me and that Smirnoff are going to have a long relationship now. I'm no longer, you know, I'm no longer dying the rock star death, right? Like, I'm no longer going out in a blaze of glory. I'm the alcoholic bitch at the DMV, <laughs> right? Or more specifically, the truth of the matter is I'm the alcoholic bitch behind the counter at Kaiser because that's my job, right? <laughs> like, that's what I do, which is hilarious to me because I'm not really a people person. I really don't like people. I'm an alcoholic, right? Like, fuck off, all you fuckers. <laughs> and I am paid now to give you the wow experience. <laughs> I'm still surprised I have not been fired. Uh, I have been written up several times, but I have not been fired. <laughs> Probably because I'm a sober member of Alcoholics Anonymous, and I like know how to be like, oh, I'm sorry I fucked that up. Please, let me make that up to you. Let me, you know, actually do my job with niceness. Um, but anyway, the, the picture now for me is the alcoholic death and the liver failure, right? Like that shit, that shit is for real, right? Kidney failure, that shit is for real. And that's how I'm going to die if I decide to drink. Like, I'm not going to just instantaneously be in a shootout the way I thought I was when I was 19, right? Like, no, I'm going to be, I'm going to have a really long alcoholic life. And I am going to systematically break the hearts and the souls of every person that I love. And I'm going to break my soul and I'm going to break my heart every day if I decide to drink. Right? And that's the shit that I grapple with. That's the shit that keeps me coming to the Saturday night meeting. That's the shit that keeps me calling my sponsor. That's the shit that keeps me taking that daily inventory even when I am sure that I have not fucked it up. Right? That's the shit that makes me willing to do whatever whatever it takes for victory over alcohol, right? That's that shit that, that cracks open my little alcoholic mind just enough to say, okay, maybe I don't have any control over alcohol. Maybe, maybe I have a disease that makes it impossible for me on my own to not pick up that first drink. And maybe, just maybe, I can do this shit when I'm sitting with somebody else who understands that conversation with alcohol, right? That's the thing that got me when I got to Alcoholics Anonymous, right? You know, all these old fucks at my first meeting were talking about literally things like losing the farm, right? Getting the DUI on the riding lawnmower, <laughs> right? I was in a small town, and I was like, I do not belong here. Right? I don't belong in the sticks, man. I am a city girl, right? I got my shit going on, and I am here talking to you people about losing shit that I can't even comprehend. And then this one woman, Indian Helen, because she was actually Native American, you know, talked about incomprehensible demoralization, right? And that that got me. 
right? I'm like, ah, I know that one. I know that feeling inside of me. And I'd never heard that before. And I knew that, right? And I could have my little moment where I didn't have to share it with you people, but I could have that moment in AA. And that's what I love about meetings of Alcoholics Anonymous is that I can have my feelings, right? And I can have these profound things and I don't have to like preach it to anybody. I don't have to share it to anybody. I just get it, right? I get it. And then at some point I get to be like, oh, hey, check it out. I know how bad it sucks to have to apologize to your, you know, your ex for doing some shit, even though he is a piece of shit. Like I get that moment, that incomprehensible demoralization where I have to go, I'm sorry I slashed all of your tires. <laughs> Here's a new set of tires and a spare. Go, be happy. <laughs> right? I know that feeling. <laughs> because that woman talked about incomprehensible demoralization. Because before that, there were those two guys who were like, we can't stop drinking, what can we do? We can talk to each other. Right? And that that's that thing that still blows my mind about Alcoholics Anonymous. You know, and, and what how special it is and how amazing it is when I come and I show up and I do this simple but really hard shit, right? Like going, maybe there's a different way. Maybe my best thinking doesn't work. Maybe I don't have all this shit figured out because I was pretty sure I did. I was like, if you just, if you people just would leave me alone, I'd be okay because I got my shit figured out even though I can't stop drinking and yeah, I'm running around with a gun and intimidating people and getting fucked up and getting beat up by the cops and you know I got it all figured out I'm good right like I'm cool like my liver it's fucked up but it'll be all right be cool you know I'll be all right just leave me alone you know just leave me alone and I got here and everybody's like no (laughs) no you need some help right you can't do this alone right and that's the thing that's the thing that like one of the things that I really love and appreciate about appreciate about AA is that like we are all loners right like I get to like work with a lot of women right and they're all like I don't like women and I'm like yeah. guess what I don't like anybody <laughs> check it out all those chicks in the meeting they don't like you either <laughs> right? like none of us really want to hang out like if we could just take be like hey AA thanks for the stuff I'm gonna go over here and do all the stuff by myself with my little ego I'm cool We'd be doing that, right? <laughs> because fuck, right? Like fuck people and fuck feelings and fuck help. I got it, right? The good news, the good news for me and the good news for you is that here in AA, we make it really simple, right? Like you don't have to work the steps. In fact, you don't work the steps here in this room, right? You hang out with us. Like my experience is that I work the steps of Alcoholics Anonymous with my sponsor, I go to her house, or I used to go to her house when she lived in Alameda, and I would sit down, and we would read that shit, right? And that shit for me, I moved to California when I was a couple years sober, so it was like 22, 23 when I started working with her, and I'd been reading this shit for a while, and, and I'm, you know, I like language, right? It's cool, but, but you know, the big book is still written, you know, in this language that is like archaic and stupid. I'm like, oh, God. Why does it say it like that? And where's this answer? And they, they, you know, there's all these times when they're like, we're about to tell you the secret. And then they like talk about something else. And I'm like, <laughs> wait, they said that they were going to tell me where's where I don't understand. Right. And she's like, okay, well, here's how it works for me. And I'm like, oh, now I understand. Like, oh, I get that. I understand that this is what I'm doing. Right. She was also really good about going through all the literature, like the four step had me stumped for a long time, right? Because I didn't really think I had any resentments, right? When I got here, I'm like, I'm cool, right? I'm cool. It's cool. I'm cool. I'm not really resentful. I don't have any problems. I worked all that shit out. And she's like, well, okay, let's talk about all this other stuff. And she went through the literature and she looked at all the other steps and all the other stuff. And and there's all these little nuggets all over the literature. That's like, oh, well, you know, we illuminate every nook and cranny. You know, we talk about this other stuff. Perhaps, you know, perhaps they're, you know, in the eighth step in the 12 and 12, there's this little nugget, right, where it talks about twisted, twisted instincts, right? Like, how unfair is that or cool at the same time that you have to, like, read all the stuff, right, and then apply it at different times in different places? I'm like, Bill and Bob were crafty. 
they were like two crafty little salesmen, right? They're like, we want you to read like all the instructions, right? Instead of just the first few, because that's where that stuff really unfolds for me. You know, and, and the longer I get to stay sober, the longer I really see, I don't know if it's genius or inspiration or, or, or whatever it was, because there's stuff that I get to do with the steps today that I couldn't have done when I was newly sober because I was newly sober and I was fucking angry and I was newly sober, right? And I couldn't comprehend shit. I couldn't, I couldn't sit still. I couldn't do a lot of things, you know, and today I get to like continue to open the box and I get to continue to look at the world and I get to continue to fit into my body and I continue to get to be happy, joyous and free. Right. And this, this stuff continues to get better for me. Right. And that's the thing, right? Like that's the thing about Alcoholics Anonymous. This stuff works and it gets better, you know? And you know, when I got sober, people were like, write down your wildest dreams. And I'll tell you guys right now, my shit has still not come true. Just FYI, by the way, my wildest dreams have not come true because they were some fucking crazy ass wild dreams. And I'm really glad, I'm really glad that my little, like, you know, my little, like, wildest dream thing, I found it, like, a, a couple years ago, and I was like, whoa. I also found, I also found, like, this serious, like, list of things that I wanted, um, and I kept that because it was like, I want a microwave oven for my apartment, you know, like, I want dishes, you know, I want to be able to go to the laundromat and not have a panic attack. You know, I want to be able to go to the grocery store. You know, I want to be able to show up to work on time. You know, and I read that list when I found it, and I was like, it, it, it helped me remember how much my perspective has changed. And that's the deal with Alcoholics Anonymous, right? That's the deal with, for me for victory over alcohol, is that my alcoholism has not gone away, but my perspective on myself, and on life, and on you, and on alcohol has changed, and continues to change, so that I can fit into this world, I can fit and belong in this world, right, and when I got here, I was like, like in the promises, it says intuitively handled, you know, things that used to baffle me, right, and the reality is that all of, everything baffled me, because I had been drunk, up until that moment, I had been drunk my entire life. People like the big family joke is like, you're not really an alcoholic. Like we've never really seen you drunk. And, and the reality <laughs> is, is that you had never seen me sober, right? Because I was drinking, I was drinking in the morning. I had, I had a bottle stuffed in my mattress because I couldn't get out of bed without a drink. Right. So people never knew that I was drunk because I was just always drunk. You know, and I see kids now. I see, like, you know, 14 and 15-year-old kids, and I, I look at that, and I'm like, holy fuck. You know, like, like how, like, like I, I am filled with gratitude, right? Because you don't get here. You don't get to be a, a member of society from where I came from, right? Like, I should be jails, institution, or death. Right. Like that's, that's the way it is. You know, the kids that are, were in my town, that's the way it is for them. You know, like, like I am like AA has saved my life in so many different ways that I can't, I can't really describe it. Right. Cause like you look at me now and I'm like, I'm a nice ish lady. Right. <laughs> like, like people don't, people don't guard their children from me anymore. Right. <laughs> people don't like cross the street to get away from me anymore. People don't like not make eye contact with me anymore, right? Like I'm the I'm the chick. Like people talk to me all the time, right? Which again I think is a really funny God joke because like I don't really want to fucking talk to anybody, right? Like for a long time I would go to the grocery store with like sunglasses and headphones on, like don't talk to me because I can't because I don't have a filter, right? Like my God filter at that point. And this is sober, right? This is not this is not drinking. This is an AA, right? Because my filter was very thin, right? It took a long time of me getting physical sobriety and coming here and being willing to do that next impossible thing, right? That next impossible, like, I fucked you over. I am sorry. That next impossible, like, I'm going to show up for my service commitment. That next impossible, like, I'm going to show up for work. I'm going to admit that I was late because I was late. 
at work. Like that, those impossible things, I was still doing them. So that filter between me, me and, and you, that God filter was really low. So when I was like not at work or a meeting, like I needed to be like, I'm not fit. Really, don't talk to me, right? Because I'm going to be mean, right? And so even then, even then, people would be like, hey, do you know where the lentils are in the store? I'm like, I don't fucking work here, but they're over in aisle three. <laughs> you know, and now it's just like, oh, I know where the lentils are, and they're, they're in aisle three, right? That's AA, right? That's what coming here and doing that stuff, you know, makes me human. All right, the big, the big thing for me now is, like, I still want credit for being nice, right? Like, I still want credit for every piece of service. I still want credit for just being human, right? Because don't you know I'm an alcoholic, and this shit is, like, work for me. And that's the other reason I come to AA, because you guys get it, right? Like, you guys get it, that it's, like, it's impossible. Like, sobriety for me and, and life Like, it's impossible. And so we come here because we get it. Like, you guys understand, like, how big of a deal it is for me to not go, fuck the fuck off, you motherfucker, (laughs) right, to everybody all the time, right? Like, that's huge, right? And we get it. And, uh, ten minutes? Okay, ten minutes. I feel like I probably haven't talked about a bunch of stuff. Cause, so for a long time, right, I have, like, the five things of my sobriety that I would talk about, which I'm going to talk about now because I still have ten minutes, right? Because when I got sober, you know, again, I was a, a, a big book thumper, right? I was a, like, work the steps or die, motherfucker. I was like, this shit is this. And I'm actually still, like, AA is not for people who need it. It's not for people who want it. It's for people who fucking do it. Right? Like, you can come to meetings all day long, and you can hang out, and you can, like, you know, you can phone it in. But if you're not actually working the steps, the stuff that's happened for me is not going to happen for you. Right? If you're not actually working the steps of Alcoholics Anonymous, reading our literature, talking to somebody who has more experience than you, and applying that stuff in your day-to-day life, you're not going to change. Right? It's simple math. It's not very complicated. If I keep doing the same thing, I'm going to get the same result. But if I try to do it differently, right, and that's the beauty of AA, like, I don't even have to do it differently. I just have to try, right? Like, I just have to try to be a nice person, right? Doesn't necessarily mean I'm going to be a nice person, but it means that I get to try to do it differently. You know, I try not to be judgmental. I am, but I'm trying to do it differently. You know, and it's that thing. It's like, today, I don't pick up a drink no matter what. And then I try my best to do it differently. Not always better, not always worse, but differently. Right? So there's five things, right? The first thing I actually already talked about, which is my sobriety date. And I share that not just because of that, you know, that great one-liner. Like, if you haven't, you don't know when your last drink is, you haven't had it yet. But my, but my sponsor also talked about the things that I put on the bar to pay for my first drink. You know, she's like, and that date, that date is one of the things that you put on the bar. When she gave me a key to her house, which was actually the first key to any house that I had had for many years. I didn't even have a key to my own house because that's the kind of teenage alcoholic I was. My mom did not trust me because I would steal her shit, right? Like, I would steal her shit. I would fuck up her shit. So I didn't have a key, right? I got a key to my sponsor's house before I got a key to my own house. Um, you know, I put that key and it was really important to me. I put that key on the, you know, on the bar. I put my chip on the bar. I put, you know, I put the things that have, I've worked for. I put, those are the prices that I pay, not just the $5. I got sober a long time ago on the bar for that drink. You know, those are, that's the price I pay. And that's why that sobriety date is really, you know, that's that important, that first thing, that first tangible thing that I have. Um, you know, and today, you know, when I hit my, when I hit my 50, 50 mark, you know, it was, you know, it, it, it's, my anniversaries are always interesting because it's three days before my natal birthday. So every year there's like judging the judgerton on myself, which is not at all pretty. Um, if you're umpty ump you're sober and you're umpty ump years old and your life should be someplace else, right? Like that's really how it works. Um, but today... You know, like today, that's changed, 
right? Like today, you know, I have this corporate job that they haven't fired me from and people respect me there. You know, people, people rely on me. You know, I have this amazing relationship with a man that I am utterly in love with that I talk to him about everything. You know, we have a soul connection, which is still bizarre to me. You know, I have this stuff inside of me, you know, that I do inherently because I've been showing up for this shit for a long time. Like I'm practicing to, to like become a, a project manager, which is like bizarre, but it's like this adult thing and it's not as impossible because stuff is different in me today. Um, so that's my sobriety date. The other thing that's really important is a home group in Alcoholics Anonymous. And that's a group that you go to every, every week, no matter what, and you have a service commitment or you at least attend the business meeting. Um, my current uh, home group is the Tuesday Night Old Timers. I'm not a good home group member right now. I'm sucking at that one. Um, I go sometimes. I go to the business meeting Sometimes, but I also know from my experience in Alcoholics Anonymous, but having that reason to be at a meeting keeps me at that meeting. You know, knowing which meeting I go to every week keeps me at that meeting because I don't know when I'm going to find it necessary to pick up the first drink of alcohol, or the first drink of alcohol, right? I do know that I still have a compulsion. I still know that there's any time that a drink might seem like a reasonable solution to me and I might have to drink. I also know that being in a meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous helps me not have that be an obsession in my mind. So home group. The next thing that's really important is sponsorship. Sponsorship is that thing that gives me that connection, that real time, that real connection with the literature and Alcoholics Anonymous and another person here. It's also the place where I get to go and share the personal shit that's really going on, the shit that makes me drink, the shit that, that eats a hole in my heart, right? The shit that's not appropriate for me to talk about here in a meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous, the stuff that's going to kill me, right? Like that's, that, that connection with that alcoholic, that's, that's the thing that binds me. The other thing is sponsoring other women. It is a treat and an honor to get to do that, you know, to, to walk my talk. I have five minutes. Excellent. And like two more things. So we're all going to, it's going to be good. Um, you know, sponsorship is, is a big deal. If you don't, if you don't like your sponsor, get another one, right? If you don't like your sponsor, call your sponsor, right? If you think they're a, a, a full of shit, just call them and be like, you're full of shit. And if they can't talk to you, get another one. There's hundreds of people who are sober. Um, steps, right? The other thing that's really important is the steps of Alcoholics Anonymous. I'm currently working 10, 11, and 12. You know, the idea of um, what are my spiritual principles? You know, what does hope mean to me as a spiritual principle? I have no idea, right? I am a hopeless alcoholic and fuck. Right? I don't know what that means, but I know what faith means. I know what serenity as a spiritual principle means to me. I know what service, right? I know what integrity means to me. I know how to walk that stuff in my life, right? That's what that 12th step is about. Like, how can I be kind to you even when I can't want to tell you to fuck the fuck off? Um, and the last thing is service. Um, I currently do not have a service commitment in Alcoholics Anonymous, uh, which was not true for a long time. I did general service for a long, long time. Um, and I loved that shit and I hated that shit at the same time. Right. And, and I recommend being involved in AA, especially if you don't like AA. Oh God, it's so good. If you're like, <laughs> fuck you, AA, you're fucking sucky. Oh, get a service commitment, you know, get involved. Right. You know, if you think that we're stupid, come and hang out with us, you know, and, <laughs> and right. <laughs> the best way. The best way to do it is just get involved, right? Like, we're here. We're here to hang out. Um, and finally, because I'm, like, way – or not way. I'm a minute over time, which is kind of awesome, two minutes now. You know, if you didn't if you didn't get anything, if, you didn't, if you're not on fire for AA, that's cool, right? If you didn't get anything out of my, my share, thanks for the prayers later on. I appreciate it. It's <laughs> <laughs> cool. Um, just don't drink. You know, and remember that it is easier to stay here. It is easier to stay sober than it is to get sober. Please, please, it is easier to stay sober than to get sober. You do not have to drink. You do not have to drink. Thank you.
Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.